Hey, hello. Um, welcome. <laughs> it's, it's Saturday morning. Uh, we're very excited uh, to be here. Uh, Live Long in Podcast has a very special presentation. Uh, Star Trek Radio Theater here on a Saturday morning, as mentioned. Uh, on this show, this is where we reenact our favorite Starship Star Trek scripts. Um, this is our third performance. We're, this is our first time doing a Deep Space Nine episode. However, it's almost like a Deep Space Nine and original series episode because we're doing Trials and Tribulations, where the crew of Deep Space Nine in season five of their show traveled back to uh, about 105 years earlier in their universe time to meet the, uh, the original series crew of Captain Kirk and, and Spock and all that. So uh, we're very excited. We have a whole bunch of great uh, performers uh, on standby here who I will uh, I'll introduce at the end but we'll put up the graphic uh, so you can kind of follow along uh, who's voicing what characters um, the uh, the narration will be provided by Ashley Millard on this episode um, and uh, and she'll also be playing I think six different characters uh, on top of that so, uh, so listen to that and we'll have uh, we have Jody Simpson joining us for the first time which is very exciting so with no further ado we will start our production Okay, uh, and let's change stream and let's put some on. We fade into exterior space, Deep Space Nine in the year 2373, as a Federation transport docks at the station. We move to Station Ops Interior. Kira and Dax are at their posts when the turbo lift rises into view carrying two human men dressed in the 24th century equivalent of business attire. They are stern-faced and somewhat similar looking, although one is carrying a briefcase. They are agents Delmer and Luxley of the Federation, Te Federation Department of Temporal Investigations. Kira moves as they step off the turbo lift and greets them with a smile. Welcome to Deep Space Nine, I'm Major Kira. I'm Dalmer. Luxley, Department of Temporal Investigations. We've been expecting you. I guess you boys from Temporal Investigations are always on time. Hey. They exchange a look. These two guys don't crack smiles. Ancient Del Agent Delmer is all business. Where's Captain Sisko? Kira points towards the door of the captain's office. Kira and Dax exchange a look. Sisko's in for a treat with these two. We cut to captain's office interior. Sisko is carrying a mug of coffee as he moves to his desk. Luxley is taking pads out of the briefcase. Delmer is studying Cisco's personal effects with a keen eye. Are you sure you don't want anything? Just the truth, Captain. You'll get it. Where do you want to start? The beginning. If there is such a thing. Captain, why did you take the Defiant back in time? It was an accident. Luxley checks this off on his pad. So you're not contending it was a predestination paradox? Delmer needs to explain for the layman. A time loop. That you were meant to go back into the past? Erm, um, no. Good. We hate those. So what happened? Cisco draws a breath and launches in. This may take some time. Is that a joke? No. Good. We hate those two. A beat. All right, Captain, whenever you're ready. Cisco clears his throat uncomfortably <clears throat> and starts in. Two weeks ago, the Cardassian government contacted me and wanted to return an orb to the Bajorans. Dolmar takes a breath and looks at Luxley inquisitively. Orb? They're devices of alien origin that are considered sacred objects by the Bajoran people. Each has a unique property, like the Orb of Prophecy or the Orb of Wisdom. The one we received from the Cardassians was the Orb of Time, although we didn't know that at first. Dolmar and Luxley exchange a worried look. We cut to the Defiant in space two weeks prior. The ship in orbit of Cardassia Prime. Cisco continues to give his account to temporal investigations. When the Defiant arrived at Cardassia Prime, we weren't sure if we were dealing with a genuine orb or one of the fakes that have cropped up over the years. We move to the Defiant interior corridor. As Cisco's voiceover continues, the orb in its productive tabernacle is, carried is being carried down the corridor by two Bajoran security guards. Kira and Odo lead the way into one of the Defiant's quarters. 
I had it secured in one of the crew quarters so we could bring it back to Bajor for authentication. But before we left Cardassia, we took on a passenger. We cut to the defiant mess hall as Worf brings in a harmless looking elderly man in somewhat worn looking clothes. Cisco continues to give his account to the temporal investigations. As soon as the old man sees Bashir and O'Brien seated at one of the tables, he rushes to them with, a jo with joy on his face. Humans! I never thought I would see another normal face again! Bashir and O'Brien look up, a bit confused. This is Mr. Waddle. Mr. Waddle shakes the hands of Bashir and O'Brien. Yeah, Barry, call me Barry. We are taking him back to the Federation. He was trapped in, on Cardassia when the Klingons attacked. I'm a merchant. I deal in gemstones, kivas, and trillium mostly. Barry indicates he wants to use the replicator. May I? Help yourself. Barry Waddle goes to the replicator. You know what Cardassians drink in the morning? Fish juice. Hot fish juice. Ractagino. We hear the sound of the replicator working. He takes the mug out and inhales the aroma. After six months, I was hoping the Klingons would invade. Barry Waddle smells his Ractagino with delight. At least they know how to make coffee, even if they are fell smelling barbarians. Worf glares at him. Barry Waddle seems to recognize that he's likely offended Worf and scurries off. Eh, sorry. Darwin decides it would be best to move off to another part of the ship. I wouldn't take it personally, Worf. I rather like the way you smell. Yeah, sort of an earthly peaty aroma. With a touch of lilac. Worf won't respond. He exits, much, much to Bashir and O'Brien's amusement. We cut to the Defiant in space. As the ship cloaks, Sisko continues giving his account to the investigators. With the Defiant under cloak, we left Cardassian space and managed to avoid being detected by the Klingons. We cut to the Defiant bridge interior. Dax is at the helm. Sisko is in the command chair. O'Brien is at the engineering station. On the view screen, the stars streak by at warp. The lights are down to indicate we are cloaked. We were halfway home, and I was just starting to breathe easy. In the flashback, O'Brien speaks to Dax on the bridge. Trust me. Next time you see him, just sniff the air and go, Is that lilac? Find somebody else. I have my own ways of torturing Worf. O'Brien and Dax look to Sisko, sitting in his captain's chair on the bridge. Don't look at me. Suddenly, an alarm goes off at o on O'Brien's console. I'm picking up a massive surge in chroniton radiation around. Before he can finish, the bri bridge suddenly distorts and we see a strange multiple imaging effect. <laughs> The bridge is quiet and everyone is sitting in the same positions seen a moment ago with dazed expressions. It takes them a few seconds to come back and get their bearings. The view screen has gone static. The consoles are flickering as if systems were only slowly coming back on. What happened? The crew struggles to focus and make sense of what's going on. I don't know, but we've gone out of warp. Sensors are coming back online. Dax studies her console. Benjamin, there's something very wrong. According to the navigational computer, we're over a hundred, over 200 light years from our last position. The interior lights come on the, the interior lights on the bridge come up as the Defiant decloaks. We're decloaking! Someone's activated the transporter. Deactivate it and get us back under cloak. I'm picking up another ship dead ahead. Can you identify it? The lights go down as the ship cloaks again. Not yet, but it's close, very close. Chief, I need that view screen. O'Brien works his console. I think I've got it. We focus on the view screen as the static clears to reveal an astonishing sight. 
the original Starship Enter Enterprise. So close, it almost fills the screen. We shift shift our focus to Cisco and Dax. Everyone reacts with a shocked expression. That's the Enterprise. They all exchange a look. We cut to the Enterprise in space, the classic vessel hanging in space. We cut back to Deep Space Nine, the captain's office, in 2373. Delmer is eyeing Cisco, and Luxley takes notes on his pad. Be specific, Captain. Which Enterprise? There have been five. Luxley gives Delmer a look, indicating that he's got his facts wrong. Six. This was the first Federation ship named Enterprise. Constitution class. Delmer and Luxley exchange a dark look. His ship. James T. Kirk. Cisco has a huge grin on his face. The one and only. Delmer and Luxley shake their heads in horror. 17 separate temporal violations. The biggest file on record. The man was a menace. What was the date of your arrival? Stardate 4523.7. They both make effortless mental calculations. 105 years, one month, and 12 days ago. A Friday. What was the Enterprise doing? We cut back to the Enterprise and station K7 in space in the year 2268. The Enterprise is orbiting an old-style space station, as seen in the original series, The Trouble with Tribbles. Cisco continues to give his account to temporal investigations. She was orbiting one of the old deep space stations, K7, near the Klingon border. We cut to the defiant interior, the orb cabin. One of the Bajoran deputies we saw carrying the orb is sprawled out on the floor outside the door. Bashir is reviving him. Odo is scanning the room with a tricorder. Kira is examining the orb tabernacle, which is closed. Cisco continues to give his account to temporal investigations. Security reported that just before we were thrown back in time, someone stepped the deputy who was guarding the orb and broke into the cabin. It didn't take us long to realize who it was. We cut to the defiant mess hall. We focus on Odo and Worf standing next to, the wall, to a wall monitor where we see Darwin's face displayed. They are briefing Cisco, Dax, Bashir, and O'Brien on what they've learned. His real name is Arn Darvin. He is a Klingon altered to look human. Everyone exchanges looks. Things just got more complicated. His surgeon does nice work. We're assuming that he came aboard the Defiant for the express purpose of gaining access to the orb. Huh. Any idea why he brought us back to this point in time? We have a theory. Worf works the controls, and a picture of a much younger Darvin appears on the monitor. This is Darvin as he appeared during that time period. At this moment, he is aboard Space Station K-7, posing as a Federation official. So you're saying he's a spy? The younger Darvin's mission was to derail Federation colonization efforts by poisoning a shipment of grain, which he was which is being stored aboard the station. However, 18 hours from now, James T. Kirk will expose him and he will be arrested. That arrest will end his career. Klingon intelligence will turn their back on him and he will become an outcast. For what we've been able to piece together, he spent the next hundred years eking out a meager living, posing as a human merchant. Then, in a final indigni indignity, he w was trapped in Cardassian space by the Klingon invasion. A moment of silence as all consider what they've heard. Then Sisko steps forward, starts to put it together. Ah, until he heard rumors about an orb capable of taking him back in time. So what's he planning to do? Contact his younger self and warn himself about Kirk? He could be planning to kill Kirk. The bottom line is, we have to find Darwin and stop him before he has a chance to alter history. Do we know where he beamed to? Worf shakes his head. No. He wiped the transporter logs before he beamed out. So he could be on the Enterprise or the station. We have to search both. 
without arousing suspicion or altering the timeline ourselves. The last thing I want is a visit from Temporal Investigations when we get home. I suppose we ought to find a way to blend in. We move to a series of quick cuts, showing glimpses of our people getting dressed, but never quite revealing what they're going to look like. O'Brien pulling off his normal uniform, a pair of hands pulling black boots on, Dax putting on makeup to cover her spots, Cisco's hand emerging from a gold sleeve, its cuff displaying old style gold stripes of a lieutenant, a pair of hands blousing tr trouser cuffs over a boot, Dax twisting her hair up on top of her head, a hand tucking a small phaser onto a belt under the back of a blue shirt, a hand closing the flip top of an old tricorder. O'Brien's hand flipping open an old style communicator and closing it again. We focus an old style command insignia on a gold uniform. We widen our view to reveal a medium shot of Cisco standing in front of a mirror in his quarters, checking over his disguise with a critical eye. Then he turns for the door. We cut to the defiant corridor interior as Cisco steps out of his quarter and sees Bashir stepping out of the quarters across the way. With, Bash with Bashir, we get our full, first full length view of one of our people in the old style uniform. Captain. Cisco figures, fingers the marking on his sleeve. Lieutenant, actually. I didn't want to push my luck. That's good on you, sir. We move to reveal O'Brien, coming towards them in engineering red. Thank you, Ensign. Bashir looks confused. Wait a minute. Aren't you two wearing the wrong color? Don't you know anything about this period in time? I'm a doctor, not a historian. The sound of doors opening off screen. In the old days, operations officers wore red. Command officers wore gold. And women wore less. We cut to focus on Dax, who has stepped out of the door and looks stunning in a red mini-skirted communications uniform. Her hair swept up into a beehive hairdo. She smiles at them, clearly enjoying herself immensely. I think I'm going to like history. We cut to the Defiant Transporter Bay, where Odo and Worf, dressed as civilian traders, have joined Cisco, Dax, O'Brien, and Bashir. Worf is wearing a turban-like wrap around his head to cover his Klingon forehead ridges. O'Brien is working the transporter console with a crew member as the others look on. The original Enterprise used an old-style duotronic sensor array. If we wait for just the right point in the scan cycle, we can decloak the Defiant almost three seconds without being detected. Is that enough time to transport us aboard? Bailey! Dax crosses over them with a pad. Chief, here are the coordinates. The captain and I will start on deck four and work our way aft. You and Julian should start on deck 21. O'Brien nods. And work our way forward. Cisco turns to Odo and Worf, who are studying a pad of their own. What about the station? Little of it is habitable. Most of K-7 consists of storage areas and industrial fabrication facilities. It shouldn't take that long to search. Security isn't as tight as it is on a starship. Cisco addresses the away teams. Remember, try to avoid contact with people of this time period. Everyone nods. We're coming up on a bench if in the scan cycle. Dax. Cisco and Dax move towards the transporter pad. We cut to the Enterprise in space. The Enterprise hangs in space. We move to the Enterprise corridor interior, deck four. We focus on the turbo, turbo lift doors. The doors open and Dax and Cisco enter the bustling corridor of the Enterprise, filled with the sights and sounds of another time. Shipwide announcements are being made over the comm system. People are talking on an old style wall panels. <laughs> They exchange a glance, sensing that they've indeed stepped into history. We cut to another Enterprise turbo lift interior. O'Brien and Bashir materialize in the turbo lift. They look around for a moment to get their bearing. Ready? O'Brien nods and speaks to the comm. 
Deck 21. Nothing happens. Deck 21. I said deck 21. Nothing. Maybe if you said please. What's wrong with this thing? Don't look at me. I don't know anything about this time period. Maybe it's jammed. Let me get this off the wall off the panel. Suddenly, the door opens and an Enterprise science officer steps inside. O'Brien and Bashir make room and try to act natural. The crew member nods a greeting, takes hold of one of the handles on the wall and, twist, and twists it. A light on the base of the handle comes on. Depth 15. The turbo lift starts moving. Bashir and O'Brien exchange sheepish looks, reach out and grab handles of their own. I won't tell anyone if you don't. We cut to the Enterprise interior corridor, deck four, as Cisco and Dax move along it, trying to act casual, exchanging nods with passing crewmen. They really pack them in in these old ships. Hmm. Cisco indicates a small alcove cut into the corridor wall. What about over there? They cross to the alcove. There are drawers on the wall and a ladder that provides access to other decks. Perfect. An auxiliary communications juncture. Cisco pulls down the drawer to reveal a tangle of old style circuitry. I'll pretend to do repairs. You scan for Darwin. Cisco studies the layout of the circuitry and whistles in amazement. <sighs> he starts making repairs. Dax flips open the top of her tricorder. She smiles, charmed by the old-fashioned device. I used to have one of these. She activates the controls, and the device gives off a distinctive sound effect. Cisco keeps working, his attention on the circuitry. She studies the case. I love classic 23rd century design. Black finish, silver highlights. Cisco looks up at her. Dax... Dax gets back to scanning. Sorry. We cut to station K7 in space, spinning slowly. We move to the K7 bar interior as Odo enters through a distinctive diamond-shaped door and looks around the room for a moment, checking out the situation. Odo moves to the banquette, which is to the camera right from the door, and sits down facing the bar. Odo looks around and surreptitiously pulls an alien tricorder, consistent with the period from his pocket, and activates it. A beep. Then he hears the off-camera sound of a door opening. We focus on a new angle, the door to the bar, as Chekhov and Uhura enter the room and cross toward the bar. In the background of this shot, we can see Odo sitting on the banquette. We focus on Odo. As he watches them cross the room, he palms the tricorder, not wanting to seem suspicious. We focus on a new angle the service bar, as Chekhov and Uhura approach the counter where the bartender and Cyrano Jones are conducting business. Jeff, that's your line. Oh, sorry. I don't want any more sp spike and flame gems. Thanks to you, I already have enough spike and flame gems to last me a lifetime. How sad for you, my friend. You won't find a finer stone anywhere. We resume focus on Odo as a brunette waitress wearing a pink outfit approaches his table. The off-camera dialogue between the bartender and Jones continues in the background throughout the following scene. What's your pleasure? Huh. I'll have a rack to Gino. You're the second person today who's ordered that. What is it? Cleon coffee. Odo has a realization. The second person? Who was the first? An older man. A human. Where is he now? I don't know. He left about an hour ago. I think he said he'd be back. Odo thinks for a moment, then glances towards the bar. We focus on a new angle, the service bar, where the bartender is refusing Jones's wares. We focus back on Odo and the waitress. We don't have any Klingon beverages. Would you like something else? Tarkalian tea. Okay. She nods and moves off. Odo looks pensive. He's come to the right place. 
In the ensuing silence, we can now hear the dialogue at the bar a little bit better. Odo is only barely listening to this conversation, his mind absorbed by the information that Darwin has been here. I have something from the far reaches of the galaxy. Surely you want. Not at your price. Suddenly, Odo hears the sounds of trilling and cooing coming from the bar. He looks up in curiosity. We focus on Burr and Chekhov as they react to the sight of the off-screen triple. Odo can be seen in the background, over shoulder, as he tries to see what's causing all the noise. Ooh, what is that? Is it alive? We focus on Odo as he reacts to the triple as it is presented to Uhura off screen. We can still hear the May I hold it? Oh, it's adorable. What is it? We focus on Odo's intrigued expression as we cut to the Enterprise in space, the ship orbiting near the station. We move to the Enterprise corridor interior, deck 21. O'Brien and Bashir are at an open panel at, at a location. Crewmen move past them, busy at their own tasks. Bashir is scanning with a medical tricorder, but O'Brien is studying the circuitry with a baffled look. As he scans, Chief, you're supposed to be working. I'm afraid to touch anything. It's all cross-circuited and patched together. I can't make heads or tails of it. Sounds like one of your repair jobs. They have a chuckle. O'Brien reaches in and pretends to do something. They continue with their tasks for a beat. Well, there's no sign of Darwin in this section. I'm going to widen the scan radius. Bashir opens the panel with the, on the unfamiliar device. If I can figure out how. Keep the scan field uh, below 20 milliwatts. Otherwise, you're set off the internal sensors. Thank you, Chief. I was listening during the mission briefing. Bashir activates the handheld bioscanner and it gives off a distinctive sound. Suddenly, a voice from off screen. What are you two doing here? We focus on a new angle to include a fresh faced young engineer. He's carrying an old style Trident scanner and is genuinely surprised to find our guys working on this particular panel. Scotty told me to do this. O'Brien and Bashir have no idea what this means. They're going to have to vamp. Oh. You were going to do this. It's on the duty roster. O'Brien doesn't know what to say. Bashir covers. There must have been some mix-up. The engineer looks at Bashir, finding it odd to see a blue shirt scanning with a tricorder. Isn't that a medical tricorder? Bashir looks down at the device in his hand. Yes. Yes, it is. I'm a doctor. The engineer looks more puzzled than suspicious. Why do we need a doctor to repair a power relay? You don't, obviously. O'Brien is looking at Bashir with the same expression as the engineer, just waiting to hear what he's going to say next. No, I'm doing a study. It has to do with work-related stress. Oh. Bashir passes the buck to O'Brien. Why don't you two go on? Pretend I'm not here. O'Brien shoots him a dirty look. Bashir keeps scanning for Darwin. The engineer looks at the console. So where should we start? O'Brien has no choice but to pretend he knows what he's doing and try to do it with confidence. Well, obviously the first thing we should do is to take this trans data here and... <sighs> pulls it from its socket... The lights dim and the sound of the tricorder's power system ebbs. O'Brien places it back. And leave it exactly where it is. The lights come up again and the sound returns to normal. O'Brien frowns, glares into the panel. The engineer looks at him uncertainly, then up at Bashir. The job pressure has been getting to him. The engineer nods sympathetically. Oh. Why don't you take over? Bashir turns to O'Brien. All right, Ensign. I think I've seen enough. Let's get you back to sickbay. O'Brien glowers at him, but is grateful to get away. 
he turns to the engineer. Oh. I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't mention this to anyone. No problem. Hope you feel better. O'Brien gives him a pained smile, and he and Bashir move away off Bashir's smirk. We cut to the K7 bar interior. Odo is sitting at a different table, looking at something in his hands, which are in his lap, below table level. We can hear the same trilling as before, and Odo seems strangely smirked by it. He looks up, and Worf enters, wearing his disguise. Worf sees Odo and goes to him. He glances around the bar for a moment and then leans forward. I have completed my search of the primary habitat levels and... Worf trails off as the sounds get attention. From his position, we can't see what he can't see what Odo has. What is that sound? Soothing, isn't it? The bartender called it a... Odo lifts his hands to show Worf, and we see that he's holding a furry little triple. But the second it gets within sight of Worf, it begins squealing an alarm and trying to jump out of Odo's hand. Worf instantly leaps to his feet in revulsion and steps back. Yo Odo yanks it back and tries to calm the tiny creature. Worf is disgusted. A triple. We for focus on Worf as he glares at the furry beast. Sit down. You're drawing attention. Worf slowly takes his seat, keeping a safe di distance from the table and the triple. Where did you get that thing? From a man named Sierra Jones. He told me tribbles like everyone, but this doesn't. This one doesn't seem to like you. Feelings. Worf takes a moment to control his emotions. The feelings mutual. They are detestable creatures. Interesting. It's been my observation that most humanoids love soft, <clears throat> furry animals. Especially if they're making pleasing sounds. They do nothing but consume food and breed. If you feed that thing more than the smallest morsel, in a few hours you'll have ten triples, then a hundred, then a thousand. Calm down. They were once considered to be mortal enemies of the Klingon Empire. This? Odo holds up the triple. It shrieks when it sees Worf again. A mortal empire? enemy of the Empire? They were an ecological menace. A plague to be wiped out. Wiped out? What are you saying? Hundreds of warriors were sent back to attract them throughout the galaxy. And Amara obliterated the Tribble homeworld. By the end of the 23rd century, they had been eradicated. Another glorious chapter of Klingon history. Tell me. Do they still sing songs of the great Tribble Hunt? <laughs> At that moment, the station suddenly goes to red alert. Worf and Odo react in surprise. We cut to the Enterprise corridor, interior deck six. The ship has just gone to red alert, and while the <laughs> klaxon sounds, crew members are rushing through the corridor with urgency as they scramble to their posts. Cisco and Dax have been pretending to work on a different wall pane. They both react to the red alert. What should we do? Cisco shrugs. They have no choice. Get to battle stations. <coughs> they close up the panel and then plunge into the crowd of crew members trying to blend in. We move to the turbo lift as Cisco and Duck duck, duck into the turbo lift. Cisco grabs the handle and twists it. He speaks to the comm. Deck seven. The lift moves for a moment, then Cisco twists the handle off and the lift stops. Let's see if we can find out what's going on. He instinctively taps the command insignia on his chest. Cisco to Defiant. Nothing happens, of course, and Cisco immediately realizes his mistake. With a little annoyance, he reaches around and pulls out the old style communicator from behind his back. He flips it open. Cisco to Defiant. Kira answers from over the comm. Defiant here. Report. We cut to the Defiant bridge interior. Kira in command, crewmen at the other stations. A Klingon D7 battlecruiser just dropped out of warp. It's approaching the station. Have they locked weapons? 
Kira studies her console. Not yet. Something about this is familiar to Dax. Kira, can you identify the Klingon vessel? The IKS Groth. We cut back to the Enterprise corridor with Cisco and Dax. Dax smiles. That's Koloff's ship. Kurzan's old friend? Dax nods. Yes, and he isn't going to attack. I remember Koloff telling me he once traded insults with Kirk on a space station near the Federation border. He always regretted never getting the chance to face him in battle. Kira gives a further update over the comm. The Klingon ship just transported two people to the station manager's office, Captain. Dax is excited. That's Koloff. Maybe we should beam over to the station and help Odo and Worf. We know that Darwin was there a few hours ago. I think it might be better if Chief O'Brien and Dr. Bashir go. But if we went, we might run into Koloff. Exactly. Dax is now disappointed. It's not as if he would recognize me. I'd love to see him at his prime. Dax? Major, beam the chief and the doctor to K7 and fill them in. Aye, sir. Cisco twists the handle and the lift starts moving again. It would have been fun. Too much fun. As the turbo lift stops and they exit, Cisco continues to give his account to temporal investigations. Dax was right about the Klingons. They were only interested in shore leave. We cut to the Enterprise and K7 in space. The ship is near the station. And Captain Kirk allowed them to beam aboard the station in small groups. When the Enterprise stood down from red alert, we all resumed our search for Darvin. We move to the Enterprise corridor turbo lift interior. Bashir and O'Brien are near an alcove, trying not to be conspicuous as O'Brien talks on his communicator to Kira. The ship is no longer at red alert. The next band shift in Enterprise scan cycle will be in three minutes. We'll be ready, Major. O'Brien out. O'Brien closes the communicator. We should find a turbo lift. They both turn and walk to a nearby turbo lift. They wait outside for a beat. Then the doors open, revealing the female crew member seen earlier, who we will learn is named Watley. O'Brien and Bashir stopped, surprised to see her. She looks up and smiles at the sight of Bashir. Hello again. A moment, and then they realize they have to go inside. Hello. O'Brien nods a greeting as they enter the turbo lift and greet and grab the handles. Dicked in. The lift starts moving. Watley looks over for a beat, glances down at Bashir's waist. Your flaps open. Excuse me? On your tricorder, you're draining power. Bashir looks down at his tricorder and sees that the front flap is indeed open. He hastily closes it. Oh, thank you. He's always doing that. She looks over Bashir for a moment. You're a doctor? Yes. I just transferred here from the Lexington last week. An awkward beat. Welcome aboard. She nods her thanks, still looking at Bashir. I'm coming into sick bay tomorrow for my physical. The door is open, and she turns and gives Bashir a very direct look. 1500, Lieutenant Watley. She gives him a suggestive smile, and Bashir is smiling right back at her until the moment she says her name. Then he blanches slightly. Watley exits to the corridor, and the doors close behind her. O'Brien makes a throwaway joke. You realize, of course, she's just using you to get to me. O'Brien activates the lift and moves for a few beats. Then he stops it again. O'Brien notices the stricken look on Bashir's face. Watley? That was my great-grandmother's name. Funny. And I think she was in Starfleet. O'Brien just shrugs. It's a common enough name. Bashir's mind is racing. But what if that was her? Do you realize the odds? O'Brien reacts in exasperation as his communicator beeps. Mm -hmm. He flips it open. No one's ever met my no one ever met my great grandfather. 
this could be a predestination paradox. O'Brien isn't biting. Come on, Chief. Surely you look surely you took elementary temporal mechanics at the academy. I could be destined to fall in love with that woman and become my own great grandfather. You're being ridiculous. Ridiculous? If I don't meet with her tomorrow, I may never be born. O'Brien gives him a, do you have any idea what you're saying look? Kira speaks over the comm. Chief, are you ready for transport? Oh, we ever. Stand by. Bashir turns to O'Brien as they await transport. You saw the way she looked at me. You can't just dismiss this. I can try. All right, fine. But I can't wait to get back to Deep Space Nine and see your face when you find out I never existed. O'Brien can't help but laugh as they both dematerialize. We cut to the Enterprise Corridor Interior Deck 12. The ship is no longer at red alert. Cisco is pretending to work on another wall panel, while Dax stands on his right scanning for Darwin. Dax turns to the right as she scans, and then sees something which makes her turn back to Cisco. Cisco continues to give his account to Temporal Investigations. Dax and I resu resumed our search for Darwin. Benjamin, look. Cisco looks up and reacts as we focus on a new angle. Kirk and Spock are walking down the corridor towards the camera. They walk into an intersection just as the intercom whistles for attention. As Kirk moves to the wall to answer the comm, the camera dollies back to a wider shot, which reveals Cisco and Dax in the background, framed between Kirk and Spock. Cisco is standing with his back to the camera, while Dax is standing profile facing left. Over the intercom, Ensign Chekhov begins to speak. Bridge to Captain Kirk. Kirk here. Mr. Barris is waiting in China E to speak with you, sir. We shift our focus to Cisco and Dax as they continue to work. In the background, we can hear Kirk talking to Chekhov on the comp. Cisco whispers to Dax. Keep working. We're a maintenance crew just doing our job. Dax glances to her left. Mr. Barris is coming on. Yes, Mr. Barris. What can I do for you? Kirk. This station is swarming with Klingons. Dax's glance falls on the two men. I was not aware, Mr. Barris, that 12 Klingons constitutes a swarm. Captain Kirk, I consider your security measures a disgrace. In my opinion, you have taken this entire... Dax smiles and continues to watch Kirk and Spot throughout the conversation. I had no idea. What? He's so much more handsome in person, and those eyes... Kirk had quite the reputation as a ladies' man. Not him. Spock. In the foreground, Kirk is giving Spock a pained look. In the background, Sisko glances up at Dax. Then he starts closing up the panel. Jeff. Free and complete access to the station to that man who just walked out of here. We resume focus on Cisco and Dax. Let's go. He begins to take her by the arm. Dax is still looking at Spock as Cisco takes her by the arm and they cross toward camera right and head off down the corridor. Kirk is talking to the Walcon. Mr. Barris, I have guards around the grain. I have guards around the Klingons. We focus... We resume focus on Cisco and Dax, who are moving down the corridor away from Kirk and Spock. I can't believe you don't want to at least want to meet Captain Kirk. That's the last thing on my mind. Well, come on, Benjamin. Aren't you telling me you're not the tiniest beast bit interested in meeting one of the most famous men in Starfleet history? We have a job to do. Dax just can't believe it. But it's, it's Captain James T. Kirk. Cisco finally takes a moment to explain. Look, of course I want to meet him. I'd like to shake his hand, ask him about fighting the Gorn on Cestus III. But that's not why we're here, old man. They stop outside a turbo lift. Dax can't really argue with that and gives in. 
You're right. I guess the difference between you and me is I remember this time. I lived this time, and it's hard not to want to be part of it again. They exit to the turbo lift. We cut to exterior space, the Enterprise and the space station. We move to the K7 bar interior. O'Brien and Bashir enter the room and cross toward Odo and Worf's table. As they do so, they pass right, they pass right by a table of four original series Klingons who are sitting and drinking together. Clearly, we've been going about this search business all wrong, Chief. You're right. Why bother searching dirty decks when you can just plonk yourself down at a bar and wait for Darwin to come to you? We have reason to believe that he'll return to this area. O'Brien and Bashir exchange a skeptical look. They throw some shade at Odo and Worf. Ah, yes. The back to Gino. A vital clue that others might have missed. As Bashir talks, he moves to camera right to get another chair for the table. How fortunate it is that it has kept you stuck at this bar for the past three hours, having drinks while we've been crawling through conduits. Behind Bashir, the door opens, and Scotty, Scotty, Chekhov, and Freeman enter and pause for a moment inside the doorway. Bashir gets his chair and crosses to camera left, back to the table with the others. O'Brien glances over his shoulder, sees something, reacts, and then turns back to the others. My God, that's him. Who? Cook. As Scotty, Chekhov, and Freeman sit down, clearly O'Brien has mistaken Freeman for Kirk. Where? On the left, in the gold, just sitting down. That's Kirk? O'Brien glances back quickly, trying not to call attention to himself. It would be an honor to meet him. Let's buy him a drink. Gentlemen. No one's buying anyone a drink. The others look sheepish for a moment. O'Brien also realizes he left his wallet on the defiant. He's right. We can't risk altering the timeline. They look over at the table again. We focus on Scotty's table. The blonde waitress is serving Scotty. Chekhov and Freeman drinks at their table. We resume focus on Odo's table as the brunette waitress comes over. What'll it be, boys? And don't ask for Rack to Gino. If I have to say we don't carry that one more time. Odo is suddenly very interested. Who ordered a Rack to Gino? The Klingons. Everyone except Worf looks around the room mystified. Klingons? They still don't see any. Worf is getting increasingly uncomfortable. The waitress can't believe it. Over there! And over there! She points to a nearby table Bashir and O'Brien passed earlier. They turn and look with some surprise at the original series-style Klingons, who do not have the typical forehead ridges they're accustomed to seeing. Worf studies his drinks as the others turn one by one and look at him for explanation. Those are Klingons? All right, you boys have had enough. The waitress moves off. Worf looks with a discomfort at the three expectant faces. Mr. Worf? They are Klingons. And it is a long story. Three heads turn and look at the Klingons and then look back at Worf. What happened? Some kind of genetic engineering? A viral mutation? Worf is defensive. We do not discuss it with outsiders. Worf is saved from having to answer any further questions by the distinctive sound of an off-screen chair being shoved back. They all turn and look to see. Delusions of godhood. We focus on Scotty's table. Chekhov is on his feet and glaring at Korax, the Klingon first officer of the IKS Groth. Take it easy, lad. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. That's right. And if I think that Kirk is a Danibian slime devil, well, that's my opinion, too. 
we cut back to Odo's table. The dialogue between Korax, Chekhov, and Scotty continues in the background. Don't do it, mister, and that's in order. But you heard what they called the captain? Look at the way Kirk is ignoring that Klingon. He's letting the security officer handle it. Bashir notices something at Scotty's table. <laughs> Chief, are you sure that's Kirk? Absolutely. Why is he wearing lieutenant stripes? O'Brien takes a closer look and is surprised to see that Bashir is right. But Odo sees that bigger trouble is brewing. I think we've got bigger problems than a case of mistaken identity. Our team watches the situation escalates out of control. We focus on Scotty's table. We focus on Korax, the executive officer of the Klingon ship IKS Groff, and he continues to berate Scotty, Chekhov, and Freeman. Garbage scow! Half the quadrant knows it. That's why they're all learning to speak Klingon E. <laughs> Laddie, don't you think you should rephrase that? You're right. I should. I didn't mean to say that the Enterprise should be hauling garbage. I meant to say that it should be hauled away as garbage. <laughs> that, that tears it for Scotty. He slowly rises and decks Korax. Freeman stands up and throws back his chairs. The Klingons throw back theirs. We focus on O'Brien as the tensions come to a head. O'Brien stands and throws back his chair, ready for a fight. Bashir joins him instinctively. The Klingon soldiers sitting nearby suddenly jump to their feet. Worf jumps up as well. Odo looks at his companions with dismay. What are you doing? Odo's question comes too late. Scotty hits another Klingon. Chekhov goes over to the table and the fight is on. O'Brien, Bashir, and Worf are swept up into the fight as the nearby Klingons attack them. Odo refuses to get involved in this barroom brawl and keeps out of the way as the fight continues. O'Brien takes a punch and staggers back into. As O'Brien falls into the shot with the bartender escaping across the room, the fight continues. Cyrano Jones crosses the room in the background. O'Brien, Bashir, and Worf are holding their own against the Klingons. Cyrano Jones is standing in front of the door as Enterprise security guards rush inside. Odo is standing off to one side, shaking his head. Suddenly, he notice some, notices something in the direction of the doorway. In the doorway, just as Jones has his drink taken away by the returning bartender, he can suddenly see Darwin outside of the corridor, looking in with curiosity. Odo grabs Worf as he throws off another Klingon. It's Darwin. Worf and Odo rush towards the door. O'Brien decks a Klingon, turns to face another opponent, and comes face to face with a very serious, very large Enterprise security officer who grabs him. <sighs> O'Brien looks around only to see that Bashir has already been caught. Off the looks of our two hapless heroes who've just been busted, we cut back to the Enterprise office interior in the present day or sorry, we cut back to the captain's office interior in present day 2373. Dalmar is looking at Cisco and shaking his head with disapproval. Your men could have avoided that fight, Captain. Regulation 157, Section 3, Paragraph 18. Starfleet officers shall take all necessary precautions to minimize any participation in its historical events. All right. It was a mistake. But there were no lasting repercussions. How do you know that? For all we know, we could be living in an alternate timeline right now. If my people had caused any changes in the timeline, we would have been the first to notice when we got back. Dalmar and Luxley exchange a cynical look. Why do they all have to say that? Dalmar gets back to business. So, your men were arrested? That's right. But instead of being taken to the brig, they were brought in for questioning. We cut back to the Enterprise in space. The ship hangs in space. 
We move to the Enterprise briefing room interior. Kirk is walking away from camera down the lineup of men who were arrested in the K-7 bar fight. O'Brien is standing next to Chekhov, and Bashir is standing next to O'Brien. Kirk turns and starts back toward the camera. I want to know who started it. O'Brien and Bashir are standing with the others. I'm waiting. Kirk stops in front of O'Brien and turns to him. Kirk confronts O'Brien. Who started the fight? O'Brien is on the spot. Can only come up with one answer. I don't know, sir. We focus on Kirk as he moves away from O'Brien and goes to check off. All right. Check off. I know you. You started it, didn't you? No, sir. Not, I didn't. We can still see O'Brien standing next to check off. Well, who did? I don't know, sir. I don't know, sir. Kirk turns and begins walking away from camera. We focus on O'Brien and Bashir, watching Kirk pace in front of them. Very uncomfortable to be here. I want to know who threw the first punch. Kirk reaches the end of the line and begins walking back toward camera. All right, you are all confined to quarters until I find out who started it. Dismissed. As everyone turns and begins walking out the door, we cut to the Enterprise corridor interior. The Enterprise officers are entering from the briefing room and heading down the corridor away from the camera. O'Brien and Bashir turn toward camera and head off in the opposite direction. That was close. O'Brien is awestruck. Me! Of all people in the lineup, he asked me who threw the first punch. Mario. And you lied to him. I lied to Captain Kirk. I wish Geico could have been here to see it. Suddenly, Bashir steps on something that squeaks. They stop and Bashir bends down to pick up a triple. I'm sorry about that, fellow. We left you out here all alone. O'Brien turns the corner and stops. He's not alone. Bashir looks up and reacts to... We focus on a new angle, showing that the Enterprise corridor ahead of them is littered with cripples. Some crew members are pet petting them, others are stepping over them, etc. Off this image, we cut to the defiant transporter bay. Odo, Worf, and Darwin materialize on the platform. Worf and Odo are gripping Darwin roughly, and it sh should appear as if they just grabbed him seconds before beaming away. Darwin struggles for a moment then realizes he's aboard the Defiant and stops. Odo releases him, but Worf shoves him against a wall. Welcome back, Mr. Darvin. The pleasure is all mine. Worf, hold on. Worf releases him. Hmm. I hope you realize you'll be facing some very serious charges when we get back. You wouldn't dare put one of the greatest heroes of the Klingon Empire into the brig. You are no hero to the Empire. Darwin smiles. I will be. I've been thinking about my statue in the Hall of Warriors. I wanted to capture my essence. He turns to Worf. Our statues can be so generic sometimes, don't you think? I take it whatever your plan is. You're, you've already set it in motion. Darwin is unfazed. I see myself with Kirk's hand in one hand and a tribble in the other. <laughs> Worf isn't going to toy with this guy. He moves over and gets right in his face. What have you done? Did you hire someone to kill him? Did you sabotage the Enterprise? Nothing so mundane. Let's just say Kirk's death will have a certain poetic justice to it. We cut to the Enterprise corridor where we focus on Cisco as he reacts in disbelief. He put a bomb in a triple? Widen to reveal Cisco and Dax at work again on an Enterprise corridor. This time, Cisco has placed the communicator inside the open drawer so that it appears he and Dax are bending down and looking inside, talking to each other. Tribbles can be in the corridor as well. It's his revenge. 
Originally, Kirk saw how a Tribble reacted to Darwin and realized he was a Klingon. We cut to Defiant Transporter Bay interior. Odo, O'Brien, Bashir, and Worf are standing near the transporter console. Darwin has been taken away. He wouldn't say where this Tribble was, but he did say that it was going to set off within the hour. On the Enterprise, Cisco glances around the corridor, which has Tribbles clustered here and there. It could be anywhere. Benjamin, I think we should risk going to the bridge. If we can use the internal sensors, we can scan the entire ship for explosives in a matter of seconds. Cisco speaks to the comm. Dax and I will take care of the Enterprise. The rest of you beam over to K7 and start searching over there. Worf and Odo exchange a look. Understood. But I think Worf should remain here. It seems he's allergic to Tribbles. Dax and Sisko exchange a look, but Sisko decides not to pursue the matter. All right. O'Brien speaks over the comm. Captain! I'm not sure we can get to K-7's internal sensors. Then you'll have to manually scan every triple on the station. There must be thousands of them by now. Hundreds of thousands. 1,771,561. The, the people on the Defiant react and look at each other. On the Enterprise, Cisco looks up at Dax. That's starting with one triple with an average litter of 10 every 12 hours after three days. Cisco just looks at Dax. Not now. Thank you. Cisco speaks to the comm. You have your orders, people. Cisco out. We cut to the Enterprise in space. The ship is orbiting the station. We move to the Enterprise bridge. Cisco is working at a console on the bridge next to the main view screen, part of which can be seen to his left. A few tribbles are scattered here and there. Cisco hears the off screen sound of the turbo lift door opening, and he turns to see Kirk entering the bridge and heading for his chair. Resume Cisco, who reacts to Kirk's entrance by looking over at it. Dax is standing at the engineering console opposite Cisco. She looks up for her sensor view scope and sees Cisco's look. Dax reacts by taking a deep breath. They have to be careful. As Kirk moves to his chair, he can now see Dax in the background at the engineering station. He sits, and we hear a triple scoop, and Kirk then finds the triple in his chair. Cisco suppresses a smile. As Kirk sits down and looks around the bridge, he looks directly at the off-screen Dax. We focus on Dax, who looks back at Kirk, smiles, and shrugs as Kirk gets up out of his chair. Dr. McCoy, would you mind coming up to the bridge? Dax finishes her work at the engineering station, picking up an old style pad, and then begins to cross the bridge towards Cisco. Kirk's, Kirk is now standing in front of the helmsman as Dax walks down the steps behind him and exit frame to camera right. Dax arrives at Cisco's station. I rerouted the sensor interface. It worked. I'm scanning the bridge. Nothing up here. That's a relief. When Kirk sat on the triple, I half expected it to go off. Nothing on the first six decks. We hear the sound of the turbo lift opening as Dax turns to see, as McCoy enters the bridge and goes to Kirk. Did you want to see me, Jim? Well, don't look at me. It's the Tribbles who are breeding. Dax frowns in puzzlement. I know him. Cisco bl glances back over his shoulder. That must be McCoy. The ship's doctor. McCoy, McCoy. Well, the nearest thing I can figure out is that they're born pregnant, which seems to be quite a time saver. Dax suddenly remembers. Leonard McCoy. I met him when he was a student at Ole Miss. Who met him? Curzon? No, my host at the time was M. Noy. She was on Earth juggling a gymnastics, judging a gymnastics competition. I had a feeling he'd become a doctor. Dax gives Cisco a sly look. He had the hands of a surgeon. 
I've scanned every deck. The bomb's not aboard the ship. Then it must be somewhere on K-7. We cut to the K-7 storage compartment. A small, dark room, half filled with quadro... Triticale. Triticale. <laughs> a high-yield grain. A four-lobed hybrid of wheat and rye. A perennial, also. <clears throat> Hundreds of tribbles are moving across the grainscape, eating voraciously. We push in on one particular tribble as it moves. And as the music builds, we realize that this harmless-looking creature is the deadly bomb. Dun, dun, dun. Fade out. We fade into K7 bar interior. O'Brien, Bashir, and Odo are quickly and methodically scanning the tribbles one by one with their tricorders. There's a sense of urgency to their movements, yet they have to be cautious. One of these furry creatures could be a bomb. Bashir puts down his tribble, crosses the to camera right and goes off screen to the bar. As Bashir moves into frame, he picks up a triple and scans it. From off screen, we hear the sound of an old style communicator beeping. Boop, boop. Odo pulls out his community communicator as he quickly scans a triple. Huh. Odo here. We cut to the Enterprise turbo lift. Cisco and Dax are in the lift, which is not moving. Cisco has his communicator out. The bomb's not on the Enterprise. It must be over there. We've only been able to get through two decks. We're running out of time. I can send more teams from the Defiant. It's not a question of manpower. It's a question of multiplication. The Tribbles are breeding so fast we can't keep up with them. Benjamin, maybe we could narrow down things down a bit. Presumably, Darwin put the bomb somewhere he knows Kirk is going to be in the next half hour. So we stick close to Kirk. Sis Cisco is on to it. He might lead us right to it. It's worth a try. But there's no reason for us to stop searching over here. Keep at it for now, Constable. Cisco closes his communicator and then grabs the turbo lift handle. Deck five. We cut to the Enterprise in space. The ship hangs in space. We move to the Enterprise rec room interior. Cisco and Dax are sitting across from each other at the table in the foreground as Kirk and Spock enter the room in the background. Cisco is facing camera while Dax has her back to us. Kirk and Spock walk across the room, which is littered with tribbles, and go to the wall replicators. We're looking over Cisco's shoulder at Dax. Dax is watching Kirk and Spock across the room. Off screen, Cisco turns his head slightly to camera right to watch as well. This is my chicken sandwich and coffee. Kirk and Spock react to the tribbles in their food. I want these things off my ship. I don't care if it takes every man we've got. I want them off the ship. Scotty enters, carrying a boatload of tribbles. Aye, they're into the machinery, all right. And they're probably in all of the other food processors, too. How? Probably through one of the air vents. Captain, there are vents of that type on the space station. We focus on Dax and Cisco. And in the storage compartments. Cisco has a realization. Storage compartments. Storage compartments. Cisco gets up and heads for the door and Dax follows him. Have him meet us near the storage compartments. We're beaming down. We cut to K7 in space. The station is slowly turning in space. We move to the K7 storage compartment interior. Cisco and Dax are quickly lowering themselves down into the dark room by a ladder. The grain seen earlier is now completely gone, eaten by the tribbles, and the room is a mass of furry creatures. Cisco and Dax gently step down into the pile of tribbles and begin, begin scanning them with tricorders. Most of these are dead. The grain's been poisoned. But they don't have time to speculate as to why. <clears throat> I'm picking up a faint tricobalt signature. The bomb's un under here somewhere. They both begin shoving tribbles aside, trying to get to the bottom of the mound. Suddenly, they hear the sound of an electronic lock being worked. What's that? The sound continues. We cut to the K7 storage corridor. Kirk is 
trying without success to open one of the doors as Spock, Barris, Lurie, and the security guards look on. It's not working, sir. It seems to be stuck. Here, let me try. Back inside the storage compartment. Someone's trying to open the bay door. They exchange a worried look. Outside of the storage compartment bay doors, Kirk is placing the lock mechanism on the upper door. He turns it, and then the door opens and tribbles pour out on top of him. Back inside the storage compartment, we see Cisco and Dax as the triple, tribbles pour out of the now open door and half empty the room. Outside of the storage compartment bay doors, the tribbles continue to pour down on Kirk. Back inside the storage compartment, Dax reacts to something on her tricorder. Benjamin, it's right here in front of us. Dax starts checking the tribbles. Cisco quickly moves over and helps. He grabs a small white tribble, scans it, and then tosses it away. The tribble goes out the open door and... Outside of the storage compartment bay doors, a tribble hits Kirk in the head as he is coming out from underneath the pile of tribbles. Back inside the storage compartment, Cisco and Dax still searching frantically. As they work, we hear the off-screen conversation taking place just outside the open door. They seem to be gorged. Gorged? On my grain? As Barris says this line, Dax tosses a large brown tribble inside. The brown tribble hits Kirk in the head. Back inside storage compartment, they continue searching. We hear Barris off camera. Kirk, I'm going to hold you responsible. There must be thousands of them. Outside of the storage compartment bay doors, hundreds of thousands. 1,771,561. Back inside the storage compartment, just for the briefest second, Cisco and Dax exchange a look at this. She was right. That's assuming one triple multiplying with an average litter of 10, producing a new generation every 12 hours over a period of three days. The off-screen dialogue continues. Cisco reacts to his tricorder, gently I, picking up a triple. I found it. Cisco holds the deadly bomb carefully, not wanting to set it off. He pulls out his communicator and flips it open. Cisco to defiant. Kira responds over the comm. Go ahead, Captain. As he talks to Kira, he carefully sets his tricorder down on the floor in front of him, puts the dead triple on top of it. I found the bomb. Walk onto my tricorder signal and beam it into space. Acknowledged. A beat. Then the tricorder and triple dematerialize. We cut to space. The triple and the tricorder hang in space for a beat. Then it explodes. We cut to the defiant bridge interior. Kira lets out a relieved breath. Kira to Cisco. K7 storage compartment. Cisco has his communicator open. It worked. Cisco and Dax exchanged a relieved look. In, in the background, Kirk is saying, and as captain, I want two things done. Cisco and Dax absently toss the tribbles into their hands away. Outside of the K7 storage compartment doors, as a matching tribble comes out and hits Kirk on the head. First, find Cyrano Jones. A second matching triple falls out of the door and Kirk looks up, annoyed. Glancing up, and second, close that door. Back inside storage compartment, Dax and Cisco are climbing back up the ladder. Cisco continues to give his account to temporal investigations. After the bomb was detonated, history continued uninterrupted. And thanks to the tribbles, we cut to the K7 station manager office. As Kirk holds up a tribble, as Kirk holds a tribble up at Darwin and it squeals. Kirk was un was able to uncover the truth about Darwin. And they don't like you, Mr. Darwin. I wonder why. Bones? Bones scans Darwin. Jim, this man is a Klingon. We cut to the defiant interior, the orb cabin. Kira is standing in front of the tabernacle. Kira reaches up and opens the tabernacle, which then floods the room with light. 
Kira's head should block the view of the interior of the tabernacle, and we never see the orb itself. By the time we returned to the Defiant, Major Kira had discovered how to use the orb to bring us back to our own time. We cut back to Deep Space Nine, the captain's office in 2373. As before, Delmar and Luxley questioning Cisco. And that's when you return to the present? There's a long beat before Cisco answers. Well, not exactly. Dalmar and Luxley exchange a worried look. What did that mean? Before we left, I realized there was one last thing I had to do. As we push in on Cisco's face, we cut back to the Enterprise in space in 2268. The ship hangs in space. Something I'd been thinking about ever since I saw that ship on the view screen. We move to the Enterprise bridge. We focus on Cisco. He's looking at something off screen in the background. We can see the engineering console. Excuse me, Captain. Here's tomorrow's duty roster for your approval. Cisco is holding. Cisco is standing next to Kirk's chair, holding an old style pad and stylus. Kirk looks over at Cisco and reacts with puzzlement. Lieutenant, er, Lieutenant. Benjamin Cisco, sir. We focus on Cisco. I've been on temporary assignment here. Before I leave, I just want to say it's been an honor serving with you, sir. Kirk smiles at Cisco. Kirk begins to hand the pad back to Cisco. All right, Lieutenant, carry on. Thank you, sir. We focus on Cisco. As Kirk's hand enters frame and Cisco takes the pad, he smiles and then turns away to go. We cut back to the captain's office interior in present day 2373. Cisco is sitting on his chair, smiling at Dulmer and Luxley. Now, if you want to put a letter of reprimand in my file for that, then go ahead. We'll have to review the case before making any recommendations. However, I don't think there was any harm done. Luxley looks up in surprise as Dalmer permits himself just the barest hint of a smile. Probably would have done the same thing myself. Luxley thinks about this for a moment, then seems to agree. He nods to himself thoughtfully and then closes his briefcase. We cut to Ops Interior. Cisco is walking Dalmer and Luxley to the turbo lift. Dax and Kira are at their stations in the background. You'll be receiving our report in about a month. But based on what you told us, I don't think there's anything to worry about. I'm glad to hear it. Goodbye, Captain. Goodbye. Dalmer and Luxley slip, step into the turbo lift. Docking port seven. The turbo lift goes down, mm. taking the investigators away. Kira and Dax move over to Cisco, who looks relieved. It went well. Cisco nods. Kira is relieved. Good. The constable wants to see us on the promenade. Cisco reacts with hesitation, exchanges a glance with Dax and Kira, and we get the feeling that he's not looking forward to this. We cut to the promenade interior. Cisco, Kira, Dax, and Odo are standing on the first level, looking at something off screen. Did you tell them? They didn't ask. Odo nods. That makes sense to him. A long beat passes as they stare off screen. I'm open to suggestions, people. We could build another station. Cisco gives her a look. That's not what he was hoping to hear. She shrugs, and Cisco turns and looks at. We focus on Quark's face. He looks very unhappy. We begin to pull back and reveal a tri tribble on his head. As we continue back, we see covering the bar on which he is leaning. We keep pulling back and keep seeing more and more tribbles. They're everywhere. On the floors, the walls, the kiosk. As we pull back, we see Bashir, O'Brien, and several Starfleet and Bajoran crewmen keeping about and picking up tribbles. The dwarf is on the upper level, looking down in disgust. We finally see Sisko, Tex, and Kira, and Odo, standing in the center of this teeming, cooing mask of lo lovable, cuddly tribbles. Fade out. The end. And scene. All right. 
the end means. And that concludes our reading of Trials and Tribulations from uh, Deep Space Nine's fifth season, uh, third episode, I believe, or sixth episode. Okay, so we're just going to turn this off and uh, and take that out of there, and we're going to sort of introduce our all of our performers. <coughs> First and foremost, I want to give a big uh, shout out to Ashley Millard, who had you know did six characters plus the narration. <laughs> wow, that was quite something. Um, and then uh, let's bring in Jeff Mater, who played many different roles, including Odo and Chief O'Brien. Uh, also bringing in my lovely wife, Jane, who played uh, Dax and Kira and many other great characters. And uh, least, uh, last but not least, uh, we also have Jody Simpson, who was playing uh, Chekhov and Cyrano Jones and, um, and some others. So, hey, congratulations and uh, well done, everybody. It was quite something. So... Um, you know, if, if everybody's got a, a couple minutes, we can maybe, uh, you know, break it down and see how we felt and just kind of, you know, give it, give us some of our, our things. So any, uh, how does everyone feel about it? Have a lot of fun? <coughs> Wasn't too bad. <laughs> There's a lot of fucking. <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, really thinking that if you're the, even as a voice at this point, whoever yeah. is the narrator from now on just doesn't have to do maybe what, maybe a couple of throwaway roles, but. Um, yeah, a couple of like, the small roles. But having the bigger roles and in the narration, I, I know is a lot. So um, yeah, well done. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was fun. Uh, did you guys like uh, my characters? Uh, uh huh. <laughs> you you do a surprisingly good wharf. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so you got good. wharf yeah, down. Was I liked I liked yeah, the guy that wasn't on. a Frenchy yeah, but sounded yeah. like a Frenchy. Your my, Cisco, my, your Cisco my always sounded tired. He was like, oh. Cisco, <laughs> right in the middle there, like it was good at the beginning, good at the end, but right in the middle, it's a little bit of Jeff's uh, Deanna Troy started. To <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I, if I, as I was switching between all the characters in the middle, I, I kind of lost yeah. track of what my version of Cisco was. And, we, needed uh, yeah. we needed the Klingon, but he sounded like a Ferengi. I thought that was amazing. Oh my god, the Korax was awesome. You like yeah, the Korax? Yeah, that was good. Yeah, that was the really Korax. Good. I was waiting for that line. I love that line in that in that episode. The garbage like, go. Yeah. As go. Oh, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Yeah, that was a lot. I that, I wish I I could have done more of that character. I would have liked mm -hmm. to um, because my my I felt like Cisco was fairly neutral, uh, sleepy yeah. perhaps. And yeah. uh, and then my 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 Darwin was like oh yeah Ferengi I'd say like kind of a sneaky kind of guy. And, can we humans? I'm so tired. I'd never see a normal face again. Can, can we talk about Phyllis Millard's uh, uh, comment here, Dave? You are a star. Your characters were spot on. I especially loved your Corex. Uh, we really yeah. need to let her know. Thank you. Thank this, you. Uh, this, uh, <laughs> And we also have um, a, 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 another guy here who says, I, I weech or a watch, I think. So hey. I'm not totally yeah. sure what that means, but we appreciate <laughs> you weeching. Yeah. Yep. And it was so good. Great performances. <laughs> we appreciate the, those awesome. comments. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, Let's don't stroke his ego. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. No, you can always. He's there for it. You can always get it. It's okay. Uh, well deserved. Uh, yeah, um, and also uh, there was a couple times in the in the uh, episode where I just didn't have the sound effect. I hadn't had gotten that one, so I just made it with my mouth. Could you oh, guys yeah, tell? You, <laughs> fighting? you doing it yourself was gold. <laughs> did, you, did you like when me and Dave were doing the fighting scenes? Yeah, the yeah. fights, and we were oh, yeah. doing the punches and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and here I am trying to do like 25 lines of narration <laughs> dialogue while you're doing that, while trying to keep like a straight, like just trying to get through it. We're laughing. We heard you cracking at one point. It sounded like yeah. somebody was, there was and then David and I started where, laughing. Yeah, there was a couple of times where I started to crack cuz or Kevin would start to laugh and that would <laughs> that would break me. I was also imagining Dave while you were doing I guess Korax, Korax doing the gremlin doing, doing the gremlin that <laughs> oh, you did last week. He was, yeah. he was doing the gremlin. A little was, bit. Yeah. <laughs> I was doing that more for uh, for my Darwin. Yes, Darwin was the gremlin. Yes. Yeah, not Korax. The, the fingers. Yeah, I was doing oh, right, like, right. I, yeah. yeah. It like a I, I just want to. I'll just bring myself on camera here for a moment. But uh, when I whenever I have to do these like sneaky like characters <laughs> like like a Ferengi or something <laughs> or or even this version of Darwin who's the villain of the episode, yeah. I get like really very <laughs> uh, uh, this, I, I animated. Really, 
Huh? Animated. Animated. Yeah. I have to, I find, to get myself in that character. And when I do Worf, I tend to like really get up straight and go, I am Worf. Did you kill some him? Or, you know, and then Cisco, yeah, he was just kind of like yeah, something else. Over. Want... Oh, you can come over. Yeah, come yeah. over in this frame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, so, yeah. Uh, spot on rendition of uh, Cyrano Jones. That's big gay L. That was awesome. Oh, that was awesome. <laughs> that was great. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, I was Kevin? like, I was like, we needed more. Chekhov was good too, even though it well, didn't sound like Chekhov, uh, but it wasn't, wasn't good. Wasn't good. Well, we need more just, um, Jody well. characters in this. Uh, uh, so I don't know about yeah, that. Yeah, Jody, you did great. Yeah. yeah. I think and, oh, I think it's ha it's better having more of us doing voices to distinguish the mm -hmm. characters than less. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it works fine if we have to do four characters, but I'd, I'd prefer to have fewer well, there's, per, per person. There's one point yeah. where Ashley had to do a whole slew of narration, and then she had to do two characters talking to each other, and then she right. had to do more narration. And narration in between. <laughs> so like, and, wow, you got a lot. That was, that was the hardest part. Mm -hmm. And the worst was because I had, like, the English the English accent down for Bashir before this, mm -hmm. and then as soon as I had to go from narration it. to Bashir, I lost it. I couldn't get... I, I There was... Yeah. I had no... Yeah, I was like, what was happened like to the British Bashir? <laughs> Yeah, I was like, it's coming off sounding kind of girly instead of English. And <laughs> let's face it, the most accurate yeah. accent was O'Brien. It was somewhere between <laughs> Scottish, Irish, and Mario. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. At one, at one so point, you were hard. like, uh, you were literally Mario. You were not Irish. Yeah, he actually. Yeah. The best thing is, <laughs> it's like oh, it's a Mario. that's a Mario. What do you mean? Talk to me. What do you mean, Bashir? <laughs> Oh, I can't wait to. When do you get my version of a Brian? In, in, and during, in during the fight, I think I said, you know, you bastard or something like that. Yeah, no, it was good. Yeah. I think that a couple improvs here and there works yeah. well. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, and as we well, as we look ahead, yeah, <laughs> and as we look ahead, I, I'm kind of wondering what's the next one we want to try. You know, we'll probably talk offline about that. But uh, if you have any suggestions out there, uh, listeners, let us know. If there's a particular script you'd like maybe just to see us do, then let us know and. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll do that up, and we and we always just randomly assign these parts, and we we, we move a couple things around here and there, but mostly these these roles are kind of uh, up for grabs every week, uh, every version. Um, so let us know if you if there's a particular story that's close to your heart, uh, serious or funny. Let us know, and uh, we'll, so uh, but we'll talk about this. This one was long, and this one actually went longer than our previous reads, like the TNG episodes. But I think because it was more. Description. There was so, was then there was a lot of narration. A lot of yeah. narration, yeah. This yeah. one was there a heavy was just, one. Yeah. yeah. Very heavy narration, yeah. 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 All right. Well, uh, thanks, everybody. And thanks, everybody who was uh, part of today's uh, broadcast. And uh, we'll see you next uh, week sometime for the next one. We'll probably put out the announcement next, next, you know, so, sometime next week with, with what we're doing and who's playing who. And, uh, you know, check that out. And check us for the next version of Star Trek Radio Theater here on Live Long <laughs> on Podcast. Um, all right. And I don't think what's our next podcast? Deep Space Nine on Tuesday and original series on Thursdays. Uh, check those out. Uh, and uh, you know, check out all our back catalog as well. Ch subscribe all our channels: Trivial Debates, Super Meters Brothers Podcasting, and Live Long and Podcast. Uh, until next time, take care.